Welcome to Go Behind the Ballot, a podcast where two Texas moms go on an educational quest to demystify Texas politics. Join me, Nicole Abshire, and my co-host, Claire Campos O'Neill, as we deep dive into the most burning issues, hear stories from candidates, and offer hope in these challenging political times. Let's saddle up and go behind the ballot. Hey, everyone. Thank you for joining us for this episode of Go Behind the Ballot. I'm Claire Campos O'Neill. And I am Nicole Abshire. And we are wrapping up our election series in this episode. We are going to look back at the past few, well, few seven guest ep- guest shows that we featured and wanted to touch on them and some of the highlights. So if you haven't heard any of them, maybe you'll hear this show and be like, oh, that sounds really interesting. I need to stop this episode, go listen, and then finish this episode, and then go find another one. (laughs) That's what we're hoping will happen here. Um, But it's fun for Nicole and I to be like, oh, yeah, we learned this and this and this, and look back and see where we are now after our educational quest journey, and hopefully you've come with us. So, Nicole, I'm excited. Are you? Me too. I've learned so much. I cannot say that loudly enough enough times. Yes, I am excited to look back because we've had some really good conversations. Yeah, I um, I felt like it was timely on purpose, mm. but our election series led up to the midterms and it was great for us to have these guests on because when people would text me or text Nicole or reach out to us on social media and ask questions like, where can I find non-biased information about candidates? We knew we had answers because we did this work, uh, figuring out how to guide people and assist them when it came to the elections. So man, like it's, I feel like this is working. The podcast yeah. is working. It's <laughs> totally paying off. <laughs> right. But it is amazing. It is a testament to how, when you do your own learning and education, that it really is contagious. And that, you know, you just, the people in your life wind up being attracted in some way to that and you become a source of information or at least a guide to helping them find the information. Yeah. Yeah. Really cool. Yeah. And it's nice being a little bit of an authority and hopefully you listeners, maybe you talk to your friends and family about this show, you yourself start to become one because as we're having these conversations, you're listening and learning and we're spreading the seeds of democracy and education information, election education information. Yes. All right, well, let's dig right in. So our first episode featured Chris Tackett, and you'll recall that Chris Tackett was all about following the money in politics, and we thought Chris would be a really great bridge between our public uh, public education series and our election series because he served as a school board trustee. So he had that experience being a candidate, um, being a public servant. And it was through his race that he started to understand the way money worked in elections. So we were like, Chris, you're our guy. You got to come on the show and tell us all the great things that you figured out when you pulled back the curtain and looked behind the scenes in this area that is so integral to to camp to campaigns. If you don't have money, you don't have a campaign. Um, Nicole, what'd you think of Chris? Well, Chris is incredible, right? He's such an authority. And I love the unfolding of his story that it started, you know, again, with his personal campaign, like you just mentioned, and seemingly out of nowhere, you know, came this tide of almost this antagonistic take on his race, which he completely didn't expect. And so that's what led him down this path. So just the unfolding of how everything came together and then how he responded to it. I just have so much respect for Chris and his story and how he chose then to share his learning so broadly and in such you know um, nuggets that we can all understand. And again, like based in fact and truth and research and not just this wild opinion. So mm-hmm. love Chris Tackett. Excellent social media follow. Oh, yes. He is so good at shining light on things and and letting them speak for themselves, adding a little bit of his commentary at the beginning and the end. 
And yeah, I love his social media. So definitely go check that out. Um, something that we spent a good amount of time on in, in the episode with Chris was this documentary CNN put together called Deep in the Pockets of Texas. And if y'all haven't seen this, you should go watch it. Still super relevant because the, the documentary really dug into big money in Texas elections. And there's a handful of folks Billionaires? I don't know if they're billionaires, millionaires, very wealthy men. Um, Tim Dunn, Ferris Wilkes, and his brother, I forgot his brother's name. They like to put a lot of money into elections and they support very conservative, far right, some would say Christian nationalist candidates. And the thing that I really appreciate about this documentary is it showed the way that these two billion. I'm gonna, are they billionaires, Nicole, or are they millionaires? They're billionaires. Okay, they're billionaires. Yeah. Okay, with a B. Thank you. With a B. With a B. I had that moment of, wait, am I speaking the truth? And yes, with yes. a B. So the way these billionaires fund these candidates and they give a lot of money to these political action committees and these nonprofits, organizations, think tanks that like work in a coordinated effort to elevate these candidates, but they make it look really grassroots. And I think that's the key takeaway, at least for me, is that you have very few people, like three people we're talking about here, controlling a lot of the conversation rhetoric in these races, and it felt so deceptive. I cannot agree with you more. Um, so yes, reminder to everyone who's listening, if you haven't watched the documentary, we highly, highly recommend it. And we will again share how to find it. And it is exactly that, Claire. I completely agree. It's the idea that there is an appearance that doesn't match the reality. And that that is deceptive, right? That is deceptive. So yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think most of us would agree that we want a democracy that's more transparent, more accountable, and more beholden to the public. But when you have billionaires propping up these candidates and then this this apparatus around them to make it seem like they're to make it seem like something they're not, that just does not sit right with me. And not and same with Chris Tackett, which is why he's done so much work to reveal what's happening. And the documentary does such a succinct job putting it together and connecting the dots. So absolutely recommend watching that and listening to our episode. Anything else, Nicole, for this one? I mean, there I was a lot. <laughs> there was a lot. I think we covered, though, the basics. And hopefully that's enough of a tease that people would want to go back and listen and watch. Yes, yes. He's incredible. Okay, the next guest that we had was Pam Bixby. She is a volunteer with the League of Women Voters. And I'm so glad that we had Pam on and that I got to learn more about the League because they do amazing work. I think it's almost like nearly 100% volunteer based. They might have, do they have a few staff members to help? They um, just hired a manager when we spoke to her, but that was their only paid position. Okay, yes. So it is by far mostly volunteer. Yeah, which is incredible and I think important to know because it's women who care so much about democracy and educating voters that they put their own time and energy and resources into this organization. The big thing we learned, I think, from Pam was vote411.org. <laughs> if you are unsure of where to go when it's time to vote or who to vote for and just need more information, go to their website. Their website is like a treasure trove of great information so that was a big thing for me and their and their voters guide that they put together each cycle. So what the league does is they create this guide and they go through every race, like everything that's going to be on your ballot. And they present questions to candidates based on their race. So like relevant questions, not asking something that they would never really have jurisdiction over. Get They can respond in their own words and then they publish it and people can look at that. They can make an educated decision on if this person aligns with their values or not and then go vote. So that is something everyone should know about. Without a doubt. And, you know, personal testimonial used that in the midterms, went, plugged in my address, got my full ballot, made all my choices uh, read up on people who I wasn't sure who I wanted to vote for and read their answers, read about the the propositions. Yes, it was, it was amazing. Yes. And as um, 
personal yeah testimonial my sister asked me about voting and where to go to get good information and i said vote 411 go to the candidate guide and she did but she noticed that some people some candidates did not reply to the questionnaire and that's just a loss for all of us because this is a nonpartisan organization this is a great forum for candidates to share in their own words what they think so I believe it's telling when someone is not open to sharing their opinion. Yes. And and good reminder that the League of Women Voters is nonpartisan. They ask every candidate for their information. They want to share about every candidate. They are not endorsing anyone. They are simply providing information for voters. Right. And they also have an advocacy arm. So they do go to the Capitol, but a lot of their work is around making voting easier. So we also appreciate all the work they put into that because in Texas, voting has become harder. Last legislative session, SB1 was passed, which put more requirements and more burdens on voters. And they were there saying, this is why we don't want these things, but it still happened. So we double down and say, yes, voting should be easier because we want more participation and for more people's voices to be heard, which is a great segue into our conversation with Emily, Emily Eby, who is our third <laughs> guest in the election series. Emily was just delightful. She works with the Texas Civil Rights Project, and she helped give us the history of voting in Texas uh, a little bit more about what SB1 is and the uh, implications of that bill passing, and then a lot of these misconceptions we have around voting. Um, Nicole, tell me more about Emily. What I love about Emily is, well, first of all, she's so fun, and so she I don't feel intimidated in any way to ask her any questions. And so I, I remember having a question during that interview with her, but she's just, you know, She's so humble and fun that I felt really comfortable asking her very specifically, what is kind of the ID, the voter ID barrier? Um, because I, in my privilege, wasn't clear on why that was such a barrier for people. And so she very, in a very lovely and kind and compassionate way, explained. And of course, it made perfect sense. So um, yeah, Emily is, well, she's, she, she has that perfect balance, right, of being such an expert. She knows the ins and outs of, of SB1 and the voting laws in Texas and what voter suppression really, really looks like. And yet she somehow manages to be really fun to talk to and listen to about something so serious. So um, I love what she represents. Yeah, she's a great teacher. And back to that uh, voter ID component, Something that she pointed out that was really interesting is now you have to have a photo ID when you vote in Texas. And we're talking like very specific, like a driver's license, or I think you can use your conceal handgun gun permit if you have one, but like not your student ID card. So the way it was drafted, it was to make it harder for some people and easier for other people. And she also points out that getting an ID like this takes time and money. And some folks don't have that money. So I really like her taking a moment to um, share that with us because, yeah, it's important. It's almost like another poll tax. So Emily was such a great guest. There were so many little nuggets like that that she shared, like practical advice. And it was like, Ah, yes, this is all coming into light because I shared with Emily in this conversation, I was like, voter suppression, like, I don't know, when I vote, it's been kind of the same experience the whole time. So I don't see that. But I know other people experience differently and I want to know what their experience is so that it's fair across the board. Yes, exactly. And thank goodness she shines a light on that. And of course, the work of the Texas Civil Rights Project we have to highlight and that they have, you know, a one eight six six hour vote number for anybody if they're if they ever have any questions about voting. Um, that goes straight to the Texas Civil Rights Project. And Emily sure made it sound like, and I believe her, that they are eager for those phone calls and really excited to help people. So 
Yes, and they want to help anyone vote. It's oh. not like we're only here to help Democrats. We're only here to help independents or Republicans. They're like, you need help voting? Give us a call. That is our job. That's why we're here. Very grateful that organization is doing the work to make voting easier, more accessible, and open to as many Texans as possible. Because as I said in one of our recent episodes, the real solution is that we should just mandate voting. Oh, yep. Remember, we're going to start pushing it. I'm ready to start <laughs> making some memes. And uh, yeah, we're just let's just start hammering it home. Mandatory uh, voting, everybody. That's our new thing. Y'all, it wouldn't solve all our problems, but man, would they be much more manageable. Ooh, it would put us on a path to a better better yes well speaking of challenges our next conversation was with charlie bonner because we really wanted to understand redistricting and gerrymandering because this has a really big impact on who our politicians are and it poses this question do we pick our politicians or do our politicians pick us and sadly it is the latter politicians so, okay, back it up for a second. Redistricting happens every 10 years. This is what Charlie shared with us. We have the census. So this is where they're counting the population. People move to different parts of the state. So lines get redrawn. So they're more or less even across the board. But that has gotten to a place where it, you can very much tailor who is in and out of these districts and if it favors a Democratic candidate or a Republican candidate. And guess who's drawing these maps? All the elected politicians who are going to be on the ballot. So I don't really understand why we don't have an independent commission. Some people outside of this creating the maps. It is how it is in Texas. Other states are different. Um, so we're seeing the same people stay in power and really entrench their power through redistricting, but really gerrymandering. Right. Yeah. Gerrymandering is, for anybody who is unaware, is, um, I don't know, it's like the more descriptive term, like that is the what kind of has the connotation of drawing those lines in a way that benefits a certain party or a certain power. And um, yes, the, it's kind of like the nice generic term is redistricting and the one with a little more kind of description and attitude is a word that's coming to mind for some reason is gerrymandering. Yeah. When you, mm. when the lines are drawn to favor one group over another and yeah, it's a real issue here in Texas. It's a real issue in Texas. That's for sure. And to the point where some Democrats and some Republican candidates don't even have a chance in these elections because the software that they use to draw the maps is so sophisticated that they more or less know where voters live. And the trend has been that you find more Democratic candidates in cities and more Republican voters in rural areas. Um, it's just been a real problem because we don't have candidates who are in competitive races. So they typically will be more mindful about their voters instead of their con their broader constituency. And we don't like that because if you're a representative, you represent all of the people in your area and you really need to listen to all of them. But if you're not incentivized to do so, you're not going to do it, most likely. For sure. And at the end of that trail, of course, is voter apathy. Oof. Which we're also experiencing because if you feel like, and it is hard to make the case that it's not true, if you feel like your vote doesn't matter and doesn't really count, then it's really hard to entice people to engage and to vote. And that is exactly what gerrymandering leads to. Mm -hmm. And some of these areas have been drawn so red, so blue, mainly red, that Democratic candidates don't even try because it feels like, what's the point? I, there's, winning is such a small possibility that no one even puts their name on the ballot. And this is so concerning. It made me go back to our conversation, conversation with Chris Tackett, where 
what's really being decided about which candidates are going to be the elected official is is during the primary race where that's the primary is when you have people deciding who's going to be on the ballot for the Democratic nomination or the Republican nomination. And in these primaries, you don't get a lot of voter turnout, but the people who do turn out are usually like super Democrat or super Republican, a lot more partisan. And this is where we get our more extreme candidates who don't necessarily reflect the will of like the broader electorate. So that's what what happens in primaries. And then in these really, really red areas, you have a Republican running, you don't have a Democrat. So if you think to yourself, well, they're too crazy, I'm just going to vote for the other person. You can't because there's no one else to vote for. Exactly. And and of course, well, maybe this is, do we want to transition? Yeah. And that leads us into our (laughs) conversation (laughs) with the Blue Horizon ladies, with the founders, Stephanie Phillips and Claire Barnett. They had this great personal lived experience where they were in red districts and they decided nonetheless I'm going to run because I want to have an I want to offer voters an alternative and I want to make my case to voters and that's what they did they ran for election for state representative in different districts um they didn't win their races but they talked about the importance of running anyway and how we need messengers And if there isn't someone on the ballot on the other party, you're not getting their message. They're not in the conversation. And you're hearing very much just one side of of what solutions could look like. So I love that they kept talking about the importance of running and having different goals in mind aside from just winning. Yes. And the importance of broadening the conversation, right? Because if there's only one one candidate on the ballot that represents one side – of any sort of agenda, the conversation is so limited and it only gets more extreme in that direction, right? We haven't even talked about the Overton window, Claire, I can't believe it, right? But that's what, this is on the path to the Overton window moving in any given direction, in the case of Texas, to the right, because the conversation is only happening in these really conservative spaces. There's no kind of tug to pull that Overton window back towards the left or to discuss any kind of alternatives or any new issues or topics that need to be talked about in any particular race. And so it really has a broader effect than just on any particular district, right? It, it means that in general, there are limited conversations happening. Yes. And we, and and they express the, the need for us to have choices. We need choices. And again, um, Stephanie shared this really fascinating story with me that's still sort of ringing in my head where she talked about how she decided to run because the person who was the elected representative hadn't been challenged. So she was like, I'm going to challenge him. And something that she was very passionate about and cared a lot about was the was environmental issues, specifically regarding the water conservation in their district. And this is something she talked about again and again and again. And as she made this one of the main talking points of her candidacy, it got on the radar of her opponent. So even though he won, all of a sudden he's talking about the environment and the importance of making sure that we are protecting our resources. So she didn't, you know, she wasn't in that power position, but she got her rhetoric to come out of his mouth. And like, to me, that's a huge win. That's a huge win. That is power too, right? To affect the conversation, to make somebody add something to their agenda that they never would have otherwise. That is definitely a kind of power. And important, so, so, so important when we talk about what feels like the futility of Democrats running, that's a reminder. Another theme that kept coming up for us is like you said, reframing winning, that it doesn't have to just be about winning the race. It can also be about changing the conversation and broadening the conversation Mm -hmm. and giving, you know what, giving people hope. I would imagine that there were people in that district that were so grateful to have just another choice, right? I mean, that's got to really change your outlook. Yes. And the other thing 
is that when you have a challenger in the race, it makes both of the candidates get out to the community and really earn those votes. And that's good because we need our elected officials talking to voters. And when you're having that conversation, you're also help you're, you're educating them on why they should vote for you, what that role does, how it impacts their lives. And I think people start to realize, oh, like my vote does have some power. And if it didn't, like why else would they be here? So, you know, I, their focus was definitely on Democratic candidates. But I think it's also important in blue districts that we have Republicans running for the same effect so that we don't have our elected officials getting complacent saying no one's running against me anyway, so I can stay home and just take it easy. You need to be out there selling your message and reshaping your message if you're hearing other things from your constituency. And it's through this um, collaboration and cooperation that I think we're going to get better in tune with what people want. And what do they want? Problem solvers. For sure. And with the results of the midterms, their mission is just more important than ever. It could mm. not be more urgent and important. So kudos to Claire and Stephanie for really going out there and trying to solve a problem that's big and that's going to take a long time and patience and their willingness to do it is amazing. Mm -hmm. And if you're thinking about running for office and you're at a loss, you're like, I don't know anything about this election world, go to their website. They have really great resources and they can help guide you on you know, if you should run or maybe volunteer or how to like get your foot in that door. So really recommend checking out Blue Horizon and digging deeper if that, if that, if you feel called to do so. And, and also just if you want to donate, <laughs> if you yeah, just believe in the cause exactly. and you just want to throw them a little bit of money, yeah, they could, I'm sure they could use it. And I do not doubt they would put it to great use. Mm -hmm. Okay, next up, we spoke with Beth Stevens, and I was really grateful that Beth made time for us because she actually has like real world experience with elections administration. So as we were creating this election series, we were like, oh, it would be great to know how this actually comes together, like who's thinking about polling locations and the experience of the voter like someone's doing that. It's not like robots. Like someone is making these decisions. And Beth was so kind to come and tell us about her experience because she had experience working in Travis County, a huge Harris county. county. Oh my gosh. I am obsessed. Sorry, y'all. <laughs> I've done this before. <laughs> well, it ends with an IS. So <laughs> there's letters in common. Harris County, which covers much of Houston, right, Nicole? Am I yes. getting that right? <laughs> you are. You are. That is right. Okay. Yeah. Um, I know. I'm like. Oh, so and for those who may not know it, and maybe you're about to say this, but Harris County is huge, over 4 million citizens. Um, I think we heard some stat the other day. Maybe I better not do this, but I, I think it's like, if if it were its own state, it would be like 23rd. Mm. It is a huge county. Yeah. Yeah, so that's a big lift to be thinking about how do I get how do I provide a good experience for these millions of people coming out to vote? Because that's important. We it's important to make sure that voting is frictionless and easy and accessible. And these are some of the things Beth was thinking about. So she just told us about her experience, her um the work she did leading up to this, and she also previously worked at the Texas Civil Rights Project, how when she became an attorney, it became clear to her that voting is so fundamental to all of our other rights. And that's why she put so much of her passion behind it and ensuring that we had the right to vote, because then you can start working on other rights that we should have. So, ah, oh man, I was so glad. I was like, thank you, Beth, for putting in that work and taking on that fight, because you're right. Like, we don't, you don't just get voting. Like, you continually have to ensure that it's there and open it up for more and more people because we also limit who can vote still. Yes. And that was so timely and important and such a great, that's probably my favorite nugget out of that episode. There were so many things that, that I just really sunk my teeth into that she was talking about, but that's probably the highlight for me 
is really being mindful and aware that the right to vote is fundamental to everything else. I feel like we cannot say that enough and we cannot highlight that enough. It's just so important to stay aware of. Absolutely. Yeah. And I'm looking at my notes from our conversation. I wrote down voting is power. And I think that's something we keep saying over and over again. And I'm the kind of person where I have voted in midterm elections, general elections. I'm voting more now in even smaller elections, like proposition elections that come up off of these cycles. Because I'm realizing, oh my goodness, like these the like smaller the election, the fewer people vote and the more amplified that voting power is. So we really have to not take it for granted. And if it's easy for you to do, like you have to go out for yourself, but think too of your community and the implications that's going to have by the people you're selecting to be that representative. And it also makes it clearer to me why we see so many attacks on voting access because People in power realize the people have the power when they go to the ballot box. So if we can limit who's going, we can make it easier or harder in whichever direction we want. Absolutely. And it is a complex issue. And so I think it's really easy to underestimate the ways that voter suppression happens, the, you know, making that connection to SB1 and what it's actually done for voters in Texas. There's a, you know, there's a lot of pieces at play there. So it's, it's really effective actually vote suppression because it can be really hard to tease out what these things mean. And especially when they're presented to you as being like safety measures and being so benign and that it's actually, Mm -hmm. you know, it's a good thing until you peel back the curtain and really understand. Yes. And another thing, I think Beth is the one who shared this with us. Oh, actually, maybe it was Pam. But this was sort of like a common through line in the election series. It is incredibly hard to cheat at voting in Texas. (sighs) We got to say that. Um, I think it was Pam who shared with us. I don't know if I wrote it down. But during one of the last elections, there was like, X million of votes cast. And I remember her asking us, how many of those votes do you think led to an like uh, worthy of an investigation for fraud? And I think I was like a thousand and you were like 5,000. And it was, it was like under 10, right? Oh, I think it was like 11, 17. It was something like that. It was incredibly small. I know it was less than 20. I feel very confident about that. Yes. For the millions of vote cast, it was like, Very, very, like under 1% of like fraud worthy investigations. And then I think when they actually found out which were fraudulent, it was even smaller. And a lot of the times it was like a mistake or something like that. So, and, and, and she said this was coming from a conservative source. And it's just so infuriating because we have an attorney general who is spending a lot of time and resources from the attorney general's office investigating millions of dollars, millions of dollars, I'm sh- ton, lots of hours investigating voter fraud that doesn't exist. And here's the problem with that doesn't exist, but also there's so many other things that need attention from the attorney's general's office. He has finite time and resources, but this is where the energy goes. And that's frustrating because it doesn't belong there because Good news, folks. Our elections are secure. They really are. And continuing those investigations and perpetuating that idea that there is pervasive fraud makes everyone start to then question whether they can trust our elections. And so it's it's really damaging. The other little thing that I want to point out is like, and also if you, let's say all of those fraud cases had been found, you know, to be actual fraud that happened it wouldn't change the outcome of the election. Like, let's also just point out that these numbers are so minute that we're not talking about election changing and air quotes fraud, right? Mm -hmm. So the other thing is that it's just, it just is so truly unimportant and doesn't belong in the conversation. We should be focusing on how to get more people out to vote, not how to keep people from voting. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Frustrating. 
yeah, we should have more people voting and we should have our candidates making a compelling argument why they're the best person to be in that position. And that's how this should work. And that's what we would like to see going forward. And we're going to keep talking about it to help educate folks on why, folks on why that is the model we need to be putting our energy into. Mandatory um, voting. Mandatory voting. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just gonna, let's just keep tossing it out there every once in a while. <laughs> yes. It's something I'm thinking about too with like mandatory voting and why people maybe don't vote is I heard a podcast recently. I listen to podcasts all the time, you guys. So I can't remember. Where, Super I can't, listener like, over there. <laughs> yeah, I can't trace this one at the top of mind. But the interviewer was asking folks, have they voted? If so, or if not, why? And there were some people who were like, oh, yeah, no, I've never voted. I'm, I'm like 40 and I've never voted or I vote sometimes. And they said the reason they don't is because they don't feel like they're well informed. Yes, I understand. Go to vote 411. That'll help you become informed. So like people have compelling reasons for not voting, but hopefully through this podcast and us talking about this more, we're giving people resources so that they do have a little bit, you know, under their, uh, well, I don't know. So they know some information. <laughs> there you go. And by the way, that was from that episode that today explained what if you had to vote. Oh, okay. Okay. That's, okay, that was thanks, at the Nicole. beginning. Yeah, yeah. 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 Oh, that was so good. So good. Yeah. And when it was when it's mandatory to vote, like in Australia, they find that people, because they have to go, they're like, okay, well, I should probably know what I'm voting for. So they do put in that work and effort. So it's such like an upward spiral. Um, and also but, it turns into a party. And it's, it's a sausage sizzle. <laughs> That's what it is. <laughs> yep, yep. So it might start as something that feels like a burden. But they have definitely, it sounds like, really flipped that on its head. And it is actually a source of fun and joy and party in Australia. So imagine, everyone, a world. Imagine a world. That's where it starts. And it exists. <laughs> like, we have a model. We have a model. So that's mm -hmm. amazing. So great. All right. Well, let's round out our conversation for our last guest interview with the election series, we spoke to a candidate who's currently in the race and we can happily report won her race. Woo so we, yeah, she's incredible and she's going to be a great county commissioner in Hayes County. So we spoke to Dr. Michelle Gutierrez Cohen and she was running to be the county commissioner. I think it was of district two in Hayes County. So of course we were like, tell us what a county commissioner does. This is one of those positions that I think really flies under the radar. Not a lot of people understand what they do and they have so much power. Like they have big budgets. I think in Travis County, which I'm obsessed with, I guess, <laughs> has like a billion dollar budget. So Hayes County's not as big, but I'm sure there are like throwing around millions of dollars oh, on projects. I bet that budget is building, right? With the growth that has happened in Buda and Kyle, I can only imagine that their budget must be pretty huge yeah, and growing. And and some of the things Michelle ticked off that they're responsible for, the county commissioner's court, is public health, law enforcement, contracts, so contracting out a lot of these projects like road projects, um, voting locations, deciding where those polling locations are, and things like road and infrastructure. So they really shape the experience of your everyday life. Oh my goodness. Like this is really a race to pay attention to. Yes. Yeah. And she gave us so much great information about the structure of, of the county commissioner's court um, that the county commissioners, of course, serve on. I, I really had no idea. So this was so incredible and great for me to learn. Um, just a quick reminder, everybody, there's four county commissioners in every county in Texas and a county judge. And they are partisan races and they are staggered terms. So to, to run at a time and maybe the county judge, you know, is in that group of two or maybe it's not their years or their term limit mm -hmm. is up. Um, but yeah, I just, I learned so much from her that I had no idea. And that feels so much better when I was making choices this time to just look at the ballot and have a better idea. And like we had met, do you remember meeting Andy Brown? Mm -hmm. He ran for county judge here in Travis County. And I was like, oh, great. <laughs> Shook his hand, having no idea 
what that role is. So it was so incredible to like have that interview with Michelle, Dr. Gutierrez Cohen, and understand, oh, that's what they do. They do so much. And as a reminder, <clears throat> in Texas, we have 254 counties. God, I hope I'm getting that right. And like Nicole was mentioning, each county has a commissioner's court. So this it, this is a body, especially if you are outside of a city limits, that really impacts your life. And there's the four county commissioners who are like just they're they're drawn by districts, and then the county judge is like the at large commissioner. So you everyone votes in their county for the county judge if they're up for election, and they are the one who sort of presides over the commissioner's court and runs the meetings and they have some serious like decision making power yeah yet. well i can't even believe it not until just now did it occur to me so i'm so glad you pointed it out that think about rural counties where they don't have any major cities within the limits or or maybe you know not a city but you know a town how much power that is. I don't know why I didn't make that connection until you just brought it up. Yeah, that mm -hmm. is a lot of power. Yeah, yeah. There's still lots of areas in Texas that are unincorporated. And I, I know a little bit of this from my own experience because I'm, I'm in Austin, but like not really. I'm in an ETJ. This is also where it gets kind of confusing and muddy. Hate that. Um, What's an ETJ? It's an extraterritorial district. Sometimes I want to say terrestrial district. <laughs> That's not I right. Like that. But wait, so ETD or ETJ? J. Wait. Extra territory. Oh, ju jurisdiction? Sorry. Okay. Okay. I think it's jurisdiction. Okay. I know it's ETJ. <laughs> okay. Um, so um, I'm still confused by what that is. But basically where I live, I can vote for the mayor of Austin and my city council representative. But those in my area can't run for those offices. So we kind of get some services, but not all of them. We're not in the city limits. So we're in Travis County and we're also in a mud, which is confusing, a municipal utility district. There's a district. Uh, there's, a, there's a lot of layers. Oh, there's, there's a lot, girl. <laughs> yeah. But the town next door to me is Del Valley and I'm in Del Valley ISD and Del Valley is unincorporated. So the one big governing body there is a the school district, but also the county commissioners. So they, you would think, have a lot of uh, sway over what happens in Del Valley. But when you're unincorporated, you come, sometimes get overlooked. And that's why if you have issues, you should go to county commissioner meetings because they do have a public comment section and say your piece if you're having issues and hopefully they respond to you and hear you out. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Ooh, ETJs, muds. Uh, <laughs> Ooh, yeah, you yeah. You gave me some new stuff. Okay. I know. We'll have to put on the docket a show where we explain all these different confusing acronyms. And I should be better educated myself being a real estate agent because this comes up a lot in real estate because when you're in these different districts, sometimes you're paying additional taxes and you're like, huh, where is this going? <sighs> it's confusing. Um, but that's for another day. <laughs> um, hopefully we made – it a little bit easier to understand elections and provided more clarity in that area. And if we didn't, we provided resources for those who can help you go get that information. And another fun thing we want to share with y'all is we are soon going to be releasing a newsletter, which is going to have fun summaries of the show and our quick takes. And of course, our attention mentions and sign up, go to our website, go behind the ballot.com, provide your email address, and you'll get this weekly newsletter, which we hope you find delightful and informational and useful. And that reminds me to call attention mentions. Oh my goodness. I, I don't even have, I got to think about this. <laughs> oh boy. Yeah. Same. Okay. Let's think on our feet. I like the spontaneity. Yeah. This is really good. <laughs> um, what have I been into? I feel like kind of the same old stuff, honestly. Hmm. Yeah. I guess I'll say, um, uh, 
I'm watching Survivor. It's like season 44 or something, which is crazy. It's been on that long. Uh, but I still love it. I still keep coming back each week. Um, you know who my kids love Survivor? Oh, yeah? <laughs> love it. It's so funny. They can tell a lot of stats from especially the early years because my mother-in-law got them into it. And yeah. so, oh, yeah, it's really, really funny to listen to them talk about it. Yeah, I always wonder if someone was like, you don't have to go through casting. Do you want to be on Survivor? I would probably say yes. I'd be like, yeah, what the hell? Like, let's try this. <laughs> yeah, it seems like a really interesting life experience. Definitely a, a why not kind of kind of opportunity. Oh, that actually reminds me. I have a second sort of tying into Survivor that I was, that I was thinking about. So Mike White went on Survivor. He is the oh. writer and I think director of White Lotus. He is both, yeah. So I love that he was like, he's like up for adventure. He was also on super Amazing fan. Race. Yeah. He's yeah. A fan, yeah. He's a great writer. Love the worlds he builds. But White Lotus also want to check out season two came out recently. Um, and this one's set in Italy. And uh, I mean, it's just like beautiful watching that show. But also like, be like it's that juxtaposition of like the beauty and like the ugliness of the world and people. Uh, he's so good at creating worlds. Oh my gosh. The way that he just so it's I, seamlessly is the word that comes to mind. I don't know if that's actually the word I mean, but the, yeah, the way that he explores wealth and, and mm. how that can and privilege. Yes. And how that can influence the way people behave, the way he just does it. So easily casually. effortlessly there's something mm -hmm. yeah just really interesting about the way he does it and and it's hilarious while also being completely galling right it's like yeah. jaw to the floor you know often in these situations but also laughing from my deepest <laughs> belly part oh uh, yeah he has such an ear for dialogue he Big can say, make his character say the most ridiculous things and yet it's completely believable. I mean, it, it absolutely makes yeah. sense for that character. Yeah. So Survivor and White Lotus, those yes. are my mentions. Okay. So you made me then thinking of HBO. I, I I may have mentioned this in a past episode. I'm not sure, but there is a season two now. So I have continued to watch The Vow, which is oh. the docu-series about Nexium. And so first season was essentially just about what Nexium was like for the people who were in it and the lead up to many of them learning the truth and then turning their backs. And so season two is now the leader, Keith Raniere, has been caught. And so it's his trial and kind of the fallout from the, the truth being revealed and him being caught and... So anyway, The Vow season two okay. has been really interesting. I did not know season two was out. So I will circle and check that out when I have an evening and I'm like, what do I got to watch? This is why I love attention mentions because it really does help provide great content to go seek out. So hopefully y'all, you know, are appreciating them as well. And if you have any attention mentions, tell us because we love to know what people are watching and what we should have on our queue for when we are looking for a great show or podcast or article or whatever it is that you just can't get enough of. Uh, agreed. All right. So remember, sign up for our email newsletter. If you're loving this show and want to support us, you can drop us a couple bucks on our website at our tip jar. And if you could leave us a review, we love that too. That helps more people find us. And uh, thank you for listening. We appreciate going on this journey with y'all. Thanks, everybody. Talk to you soon. Thank you, everybody, for joining me, Nicole Abshire, and my co-host, Claire Campos O'Neill, on Go Behind the Ballot. Hopefully, we've demystified some little portion of Texas politics, and we hope that you'll do more with us. Check out our website at www.gobehindtheballot.com, where you'll find links to all of our social media, and you will find our community. Let's join together and do more. We hope you'll let us know what is working, and we hope you'll join us next week. Thanks, everybody, and have a good one.